Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to talking to teachers or talking with teachers. Uh, today, our special guest is Sheikh Mohammed bin Yahya Ninui. Sheikh Ninui uh, was born in Syria. Uh, he is an American Islamic scholar, theologian, and medical doctor. He has been listed among the most 500, the, the 500 most influential Muslims in the publication compiled by the Royal Islamic Strategic Studies Center in Amman, Jordan. He also attended at Azhar University, uh, the faculty of Usul al-Din, where he studied under, under many scholars. He also holds a PhD in Hadith Sciences from Azhar University. He also traveled to seek knowledge under many scholars who resided in Syria, Medina, Mecca, Morocco, Egypt, Sudan, and other places. He is the first PhD in Islamic studies from the Department of Religion at the University of Georgia. Sheikh Ninui is the founding director of Medina Institute, Medina Seminary, and Planet Mercy with campuses in the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, South Africa, Norway, Sudan, and Malaysia. Sheikh Ninui also holds a bachelor's degree in microbiology from the University of Illinois and a doctor of medicine uh, or a doctor of medicine degree as well. So of course, a very accomplished individual and a man that I truly love. Uh, we like to welcome Sheikh Ninui. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa Sorry, I was just turning my phone. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. It's an honor to be with you. Sorry, I wasn't, I didn't pay attention. I got a few phone calls in the middle and a few text messages. I'm sure you're familiar with that scene all the time. Yes, right, exactly. exactly. It's very nice to be with you, Sheikh Abdullah. It's an honor always uh, to be with you. And uh, I know some of your students here in town in Atlanta. So every time I see them, I remember you as well. Allah bless you and bless your work and what you do. Uh, I, I hope what was mentioned is is uh, is correct and if it is may allah forgive me and if it's not may allah forgive me anyway <laughs> no it's definitely an honor and uh and a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you i know that you're very busy uh in high demand and um and so i really do feel special to uh receive an acceptance uh of the request uh to have you join of the podcast, you know, so I, I definitely um, um, I, I thank you for that. Um, now, I, I read, of course, just a brief, uh, very short version of your bio. And of course, there's a lot more that could be said about that. And um, I like to begin these conversations with a fundamental question about uh, who you are, right? In other words, we know you as a public personality. Uh, but I, I like to uh, ask my guests to see if they can dig a little, little bit deeper uh, to give us information uh, to help us to fully understand who Sheikh Ninui is. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I'm, what I mean by that is, you know, family background, you know, what, what's your journey? How did you get to where you are today? Um, um, what was that like, right? So uh, if you are willing to provide any of those details, and I understand, of course, out of humility, uh, you won't <laughs> like to share certain things, but we, you know, we, we would like to know a little bit more about, you know, Sheikh Nidami, inshallah. Astaghfirullah, bismillah rahman rahim The poor slave was born in Aleppo, Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, the family was a conservative family. Uh, 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 that was involved with scholarship and uh, knowledge circles uh, that afforded me the opportunity to uh, access many scholars who either would visit us at home, for example, as guests of my father, Allah Yerhamu, or uh, of the rest of the family. Uh, my uncle had graduated from, at that time, um, 50 years ago, if you graduate with a bachelor's degree from a... a a university of Sharia, you're a scholar. I mean, at least in the masses view. So mm -hmm. uh, my uncle had done that. And then uh, he went to law school as well. And so he was also, he had his own circles mm -hmm. and he shared an office with uh, uh, the probably the most, uh, 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 if you want to call uh, uh, erudite, I mean, I don't know if I use these words correctly as well. <laughs> yeah. A Hanafi scholar at that time, 
um, who was really a, sort of a specialist in Ibn Abidin. Mm. Uh, so that also was there. Uh, from the beginning, I I was I had the honor of attending uh, uh, Masjid Omar Salim in the neighborhood where the Sheikh uh, was teaching uh, Quran, and I had taken from him the Book of Allah Azza wa Jal. And then I uh, attended as I even from seven years old I would be going with my father and, and my uncle. I still remember that. Obviously, the circles of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Isa. Mm. Uh, who is more in tasawwuf. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very close to the family. So we were, you know, he would come to our homes often. And our family was kind of attached to him a lot in many ways. Uh, so his circles were, and Tarbiya was, were circles that I uh, grew up in, I would say. But after that also, I would not, I would not miss the, uh, tafsir lecture of Sheikh or Sheikh Sheikh Abdullah Sarajuddin mm -hmm. uh, in Al Umawi Masjid in Aleppo, which was mm -hmm. the it's the biggest masjid in Aleppo, Masjid Bani Umayyah Al Kabir, or Al Masjid Al Kabir, uh, and Tuesdays as well uh, would catch him uh, in in the other sessions. Mm -hmm. um, I also had the honor of attending um, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Hassoun, Rahimahullah Taala. From Badr Din Hassoun, not Ahmed Hassoun, Badr Din Hassoun in Jame Aghyor in Maysaloon. And he was Shafi'i and he would also teach the Hikam. He was Shafi'i in Naqshbandi, but he would teach the Hikam of Ibn Ata. So that was my first mm. my first intro to the Hikam mm -hmm. uh, of Ibn Ata on the Sheikh Badr Din, Rahimahullah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Obviously, within the family, we have people who were not only he were they were a imma uh, in my uh, my cousin's sides. Uh, the Imam of uh, Jami Abu Al Ahmar, Sheikh Abdul Razak, Rahimahullah. Uh, the Imam of Jami Abu Bakr Al Siddiq, uh, Sheikh Abu Shok, Rahimahullah. They're all cousins uh, mm -hmm. of my of our. <coughs> um, after that, also in in Aleppo was. Uh, uh, the students of Sheikh Abdul Qadir after Sheikh Abdul Qadir had left uh, Syria, so uh, Sheikh Nadim Shabi, Sheikh, uh, uh, and others as well that I was very, very close to. Specifically, I would say Sheikh Nadim, Rahimahullah, or Hafizahullah, Afwan. Sheikh Adnan Ghashim in Hadith and Shafi Fiqh was also uh, someone who was uh, I was very, very close to, especially also lately as well, not just before. Uh, he was also, he knew the family, he was a friend of the family as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th those are some of the people that I <laughs> grew up basically with mm -hmm. and had the opportunity of, let's say, either. And obviously before that in Jami'a Rawda in Aleppo, uh, I had, she, we had circles of shiuk started. And they what used to do, they used to have beginner, middle and advanced level, let's say. And they start with the fiqh, obviously, as you know, in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. The focus is fiqh, maybe also in the whole Muslim world, to be honest right. with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, usul and uh, and hadith, that was not necessarily something focused on as much. Fiqh mm -hmm. was what was focused on. Fiqh and tarbiyah, fiqh and tazkiyah, let's say. Mm -hmm. So uh, we would start with the basic Hanafi fiqh, let's say, in the uh, beginner circles in Jami'a Rawda mm -hmm. with uh, our sheikh, uh, uh, over there, Rahimahullah, and now is, I'm so I'm getting so old, and the names yeah. are, uh, are escaping yeah, me. No, uh, I, because there's so many, mashallah. Yes. <laughs> no, Sheikh no, Sheikh uh, Jamal Rauda, Rahimahullah, was a, yani, the family was a Rifai descendant now, but the very name escapes me, and I apologize about that. I'm not. I, um, and then we would move from the beginner to the middle levels. So, you know, you'd start with all these, uh, basically, it's basically Hanafi stuff, mostly Hanafi fiqh stuff. Mm -hmm. And like I said, tafsir was with our Sheikh, Sheikh Abdullah Siraj, mm -hmm. uh, Rahimahullah, and uh, Sira and that, you'll see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, from Aleppo, obviously, I moved out, mm -hmm. left Syria, I uh, went to Egypt as well, signed up with 
uh, al-azhar and uh, that gave me a, a bigger opportunity eventually to be mm -hmm. exposed to more than the syrian scholarship i mm -hmm. did not know much about any scholars in syria other than aleppo aleppo is about 360 kilometers north of damascus we're very very close to the turkish borders mm -hmm. so it's sort of like a state on its own <laughs> so you know if you're less than 20 years old and I, I left when I was 17 okay. you don't get to travel freely those days I mean travel was not you know you don't travel when you're that yet young anyway at least that was the customs then so I don't know any of other I've heard Sheikh Abdul Aziz uh, Sud, for example of the Quran in Hims okay. uh, my father Rahimullah, used to ad admire so much and there was a relationship so I would hear of some of the names but not necessarily, but Sheikh, obviously, Muhammad Saeed Ramadan al-Buti, rahimahullah. He was known. My brother studied with him. I did not study <laughs> with him. But known, obviously, Sheikh Nuruddin Atir as well, etc. Uh, then in Egypt, you know, Egypt is open for everybody and everybody is there. So, Tawsi uh, al-Madarik a little bit and al-Madahib as well. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you see different currents, different things. And mm -hmm. it, to be honest with you, in Syria, it was pretty much traditional Ahl Sunnah, mm -hmm. yani meaning uh, you're either a Hanafi or a Shafi, mostly. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're mostly Ash'ari anyway, or maybe softly Maturidi, because the, the differences were vague, to be honest with you. And everybody was, I would say, a Ghazali Sufi line. I'm not saying a Ghazali per se. I'm mm -hmm. saying the Ghazali Junaidi line of Tasawwuf, right? Yeah. So we identify. Uh, sure, there's Turukism as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very prominent. But the general line was a Ghazalian, Junaidi, Ghazalian line of Sufism. Right, right. That was well, there. In, in Egypt is everything and everybody. And that yeah. gave me, obviously, lots of exposure to lots of Mashaikh and, and all that. And... Uh, I started then, uh, you know, sort of developing a, a, a care for hadith studies mm -hmm. simply for many reasons. Obviously, the love of the sunnah. I realized that nobody disagrees on about the Quran. Yeah, yeah. Everybody disagrees about the sunnah and what is really sunnah versus not. And also at that time, the uh, really uh, uh, growing, and I'm talking in the 19, let's say, late 80s, the, the height of the Salafi movement, which was really about the Hadith and that, you know, how other groups were not necessarily knowledgeable in Hadith right. and how some big scholars were shut down because of not, not their, their lack of knowledge in Hadith studies and the Sunnah. So I really wanted to know, what this this is all about? So I, you know, I met Sheikh Albani, for example, mm -hmm. okay. and, and tried to learn, uh, you know, see what it is. And obviously, I met his opponents. So that led me to the Umari scholars, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was with the Wasiyar. Yani my father had met Sayyid Ahmed when he came to to mm -hmm. Syria, uh -huh. uh, but then he, he spoke about that. So I started following them, seeing what they are, uh, reading their books. Eventually. In the early 90s, I traveled to Morocco with this with this specific reason okay. for, uh, to meet Said Abdullah ibn Siddiq, nothing else. I did not have any other, I did not know anything about Morocco or anything about anyone. I just knew you need to go to Tangier, and from mm -hmm. Tangier, you need to go <laughs> and see a, a scholar named Abdullah ibn Siddiq. So, uh, uh, you know, I did that and I start going to Morocco every now and then whenever I have a chance, I go and review a couple of things you read before you go and, mm -hmm. and do Mudhakara with the Sheikh. You read, right. you know, and obviously I met many others as well over mm -hmm. there, the brothers of the Sheikh and other Shiuch as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it grew and obviously I came to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, after that and... Uh, in the U.S., I really did not mean it. In Syria, I think, or the kind of, or the environment I came from, was you do the dean as anyway because that's what you're supposed to do and learn and maybe also be participant and teach, mm -hmm. uh, and you do something for your dunya. So that's what it is, right? It's not. It wasn't meant to be a full time thing, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went and eventually. Uh, you know, I did my, my bachelor's, I did my doctor of medicine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's the idea. And I taught, obviously, with I taught medicine for about uh, 10 years at the university. Oh, really? Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the University of Georgia here. So mm -hmm. 
Um, and then I feel obviously I did my uh, PhD in Islamic studies at the uh, University of Georgia. Uh, and but I would say from 9/11, uh, to be honest with you, I took a much more full-time approach to it. And uh, that 9/11 was a was a wake-up call for me because I started seeing people on TV, on national TV, mm-hmm. uh, and, and under their name, Islamic expert. <laughs> and, and and everything I hear from them seems to be like they've never even read a book about this, a booklet about Islam. Right, yeah. I, I was wondering, how do these people say they represent Islam mm-hmm. and speak on behalf of Islam in, on national media outlets? Mm-hmm. And they're totally, they don't, I don't relate to them. I don't know what they're talking. Yeah. I don't know the Islam they're talking about. It's not that what I learned. Right. right. You know, so I mean, so I figured, you know what, I need to do a little bit more uh, for myself and the community. I I felt, look, if I'm going to get married and have children uh, and be in and remain in this country and, and, you know, this country became home to me, obviously, uh, I need to also provide for my for the next generation something from what we've learned. Uh, and, And that was in addition, to be honest with you, to. To obviously, I have been working from the from the early nineties till two thousand, yeah. till nine eleven. I've been working. I wouldn't say full time, but being in the masajid was a a daily thing in my life. Being mm-hmm. participant in activities and all that, and mm-hmm. a lot of it was also and to maintain my own iman and also to 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 stand against the the I would say the takfiri onslaught movement at that yeah. time. Because mm-hmm. at that time, between if you if you remember the '90s entirely, those ten years, mm-hmm. it wasn't simply this is our views and you're a person of bid'ah. It mm-hmm. was if you don't believe like us, right. you are actually probably a mushrik, right? And the least you are muqtada. So takfir was mm-hmm. was just the, the the thing of the day, mm-hmm. and that also involved, uh, you know, sort of. Uh, you know, uh, erecting hate under the banner of Islam or following the Sunnah and legitimizing hate against other Muslims when they disagree. All that were, I was involved and and, and I was right at the forefront of all that. Right. Uh, trying to sort of break that or, or, or stand against that wave of exclusive righteousness Mm-hmm. Uh, that the uh, some uh, some some elements of the Salafi movement right. uh, was leading, I yeah. would say but that was part of just the whole thing. And right. again, I, I had the honor of studying with Sheikh Abdulaziz bin Baz, rahimahullah, <laughs> and benefited from him. So I, I don't have an issue. Again, I don't think it needless to say mm-hmm. uh, with uh, someone wanting to be Salafi or Sufi. Although I think both these terms are innovative terms, mm-hmm. we don't necessarily need the terms. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have an issue with 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 an understanding of the texts. In being implied as the texts and the exclusive righteous way, especially when it's coupled with inciting hate against the other, right. let alone like fear against other Muslims. Right. So I thought that was that was really alarming, and that's why I was involved. But then when 9-11 happened, it, it was just, I need to get involved full-time. And that's when I started with Medina Institute, more yeah, seriously. Inshallah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's... that's Definitely a lot of parallels and overlap with myself in that particular regard. Of course, I mean, I haven't been as uh, as public uh, as you have, and uh, you know, but you know, I've, I've mainly tried to focus on my writings and things like that, you know, but haven't necessarily been on the world stage like you have. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you and magnify your benefit. Um, so, so I mean, so it sounds like you memorized the Quran when you were very young, um, and you know, as a teenager. Uh, you went to school or you, you studied with you know, some of the private teachers and then eventually, of course, the school in, in Halab and then eventually you go to, to Egypt, to Azhar. And so I'm assuming by the time you make it to the United States, you are in your 20s. This is what happens. Yes, yeah. that's okay. right. You're in the that's US. right. You know, and so so at what point in your your education did you develop an interest in medicine? Uh, that's interesting. I, I asked uh, one of my shiuch when I uh, first arrived to the U.S. and I wanted to, you know, I had memor- I memorized of the of the Quran on two on two riwayah at least. I was working towards the seventh, mm-hmm. the seventh, and uh, 
uh, with basic knowledge and I'm going back and forth now to finish the degree. Okay. And I said, all right, I'm looking for Imam, but everyone here says that if you, uh, you know, uh, if you, Al-Ghazali is a Mubtadi, Al-Ash'ari uh, is a Mubtadi, uh, maybe his, Ibn Hajar has issues in Aqeedah. This yeah, yeah, was yeah. the, this, uh, Nawawi has serious problems with it, Tasawwuf. Mm. So these things, and again, I, I recognize that they're, they're extremists on all sides. Mm. And I, I, I didn't, I, I should say, uh, you know, I, I eventually learned that there was also Takfiri Sufis, not just Takfiri right. Salafis. So right. <laughs> just to be on the, on the full, on the full yeah. scale. But mm. that was a situation in the U.S. So, well, you know, the, he said, son, I, I, you know, I told you, you should never, ever use that to work anyway. Go do something else. I said, what should I do? He says, why don't you do medicine? It's like, <laughs> like a good field. And mm -hmm. I've always had interest in that. So uh, that, that led me to do it. Yeah, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then, so, so how many years did you study? Could, because you say you, you started to teach at university. You taught the university. For yeah, years. I taught at the University of Georgia from 2001 to, two, to the University System of Georgia from 2001 till 2010. Right. So, so you, that's you, way later, right after yeah. I graduated and all that. Oh, my it's God. Just, yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's amazing. Really amazing. Yeah. But um, yeah, Alhamdulillah. Uh, so you mentioned. Of course, that you traveled around, you met some of the the, the major names, some of the ulama, Sheikh Al Bani, um, Bin Baz, I mean, in, in particular, you know those who are the popular, Salafi, popular Salafi um, ulama who, you know, we know were the, of course, a uh, catalyst for controversies in a lot of ways. But then you also study with uh, the Humariya, right, as well, right, in in, uh, in Morocco, and um, um, I, I was wondering if you could spend a little bit of time in in you know, teaching the audience uh, about who they were um, and why they were significant uh, you know, during that time and perhaps even still today. Yeah, uh, obviously, uh, Sheikh Al-Bani, I met in, in, in Jordan mm -hmm. on a couple of occasions, couple of majalis only, and the Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, rahimahullah, in Saudi Arabia and the public masajid lectures. Mm -hmm. um, as uh, far as the Umaris, obviously, like I said, the journey starts with them very early on uh, from Aleppo, looking at their literature and reading some of their stuff. And uh, I was obviously fascinated with the knowledge in Hadith because mm -hmm. I realized the knowledge in Hadith. Well, at that time, Hadith seems to be taking over everything because it's uh, to some people, I mean, the Hadith was the benchmark even for the Quran yeah. to some mm -hmm. extremists, yeah. unfortunately. So... Uh, and uh, and I realized that all they're fighting about, those who are, let's say, towards this side are using hadith to substantiate their, their views. And those who are on this side are also using hadith to substantiate mm -hmm. their views. Mm -hmm. And I'm here. All right. What do I do? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I traveled to Morocco and I uh, obviously started uh, developing a a, a, a a likeness to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Ghumari scholars, they're different from, I would say, all the hadith scholars I've ever met. Mm -hmm. And they had a big... Um, impact on me except obviously the my main sheikh who had much bigger impact on me in hadith and others who sheikh uh, muhammad adab al hamsh al husseini mm -hmm. uh, obviously whom i view as uh, of more knowledgeable even and more of an authority mm -hmm. uh, in hadith and others but uh, uh, the Ghumaris first caught my attention obviously because of their uh, uh, hadith they, I was used to fiqh being taught. Uh, so and so said, Imam so and so said, Imam so and so said, Imam so and we memorized them, right? Mm -hmm. Whether the mutun and in different madahib and all that. Mm -hmm. Here I came to where the sheikh says, Well, you know, uh, this is uh, what the Shafi'i or this is what Imam Malik says, and the hadith says this. Mm -hmm. So there's always backing up of the, the right. text, backing the hadith, mm -hmm. backing the scholarly views with hadith. And I thought that was very important because. Mm -hmm. We need to back up. So Al Gumaris were the Gumaris were really the people who were, if you want to say non muqallid غير muqallid yani I'm gonna say, mm -hmm. yeah. but yet not salafi in the sense yeah. of mm -hmm. uh, the issues of aqaid, yani for sifat, the issues of sifat mm -hmm. and issues of, uh, and they were not takfiris also. Mm -hmm. uh, they did, yani Sayyid Ahmad was a bit harsh against taqlid. But the other, or against others, but uh, 
I would say the rest of the body of the, the six Rumari brothers mm -hmm. were not uh, takfiris per se. They are, even if they had a harsh view. Mm -hmm. And to me, takfir was very, very, very serious. Mm -hmm. When you say someone is not Muslim or someone is against the Sunnah and mm -hmm. hates the Sunnah because let's say he, he follows a different school of thought. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was... Uh, the the Umari schools were uh, independent thinkers. They uh, did tahsil first, ac acquired ulum mm -hmm. al-ala, and um, they viewed, uh, uh, to a large extent, that while taqlid is okay, but one should, the, the objective is that one should always stand with the authentic evidence, right. the mm -hmm. authentic hadith, irrespective of who mm -hmm. they disagree with. Right, right. And sure, there needs to be fiqh nas, mm -hmm. not just the nas, that it is authentic, but the fiqh of the dalil. And they were good in that as well. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, they were also, I found them as reformists, let's yeah. say. Right, yeah. Uh, right, because for, for, mm -hmm. for long years, and I've had this, the honor to study with mm -hmm. Sheikh Ahmed Tawir, Rahimahullah, mm -hmm. the, the uh, Sheikh of Kursi, mm -hmm. Imam Malik, Fil Qarawiyin, mm -hmm. right, okay. uh, right? And, and all that. So, but, and, and others like him, mm -hmm. and, and they're all great people, not them necessarily, but fiqh was, or the way the tradition has been for 200 years or so, was very rigid, mm -hmm. and you just need to memorize mm -hmm. and then regurgitate. I saw, and maybe that's the ones I saw. I saw with the Umaris, people who actually look at the Dalil. They yeah. try to reconcile the Dalil with the statements of scholars. Yeah. And, and, and see that which is consistent. They would put form, uh, forward that which is not consistent. They would find an excuse for and, and etc. I thought that that was more important for me to follow. And they also were reformers at the Sawwuf. Mm -hmm. uh, and they really wrote some harsh things against some, mm -hmm. some tasawwuf or some turuqism yeah. that that is not consistent yeah, like, with the book and the sunnah. Yeah, like Sheikh Muhammad Zamzami, you know, he seemed he was a bit harsh against the, the, the Sophia and even seemed like his some of his own family members at first. And then sort of there was a, a uh, an expression of regret later in his life and sort of Correct. Like moderation Correct. happens, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So and their I, view was, wherever the Dalil is, is where you'll find us. Right. And if we're wrong, we're wrong. Our excuse is we're following the Dalil. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. That was something that, that attracted me uh, right. to them, obviously. And then from them to uh, the, my main sort of sheikh and teacher. No. Right, right. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like, um, I'm, I'm looking at even like your own orientation, if we can call it that, you know, I mean, in the sense of, I think it's very traditional, you know, and that okay, well, I can you can you can take you can benefit from many people. You, you can differ with them ideologically, but you can still find something to take away from them, right? You know, Salafi or Sufi or whatever. She it, 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 it doesn't matter. You this because you know there's you know truth with everyone. You know, every, everyone is not correct, incorrect about everything. And when I look at the Gomadis, at least the three that I'm familiar with a little bit, you know, with Sheikh, Sheikh Abdullah. Uh, you know, Sheikh Abdullah Ghamari and Sheikh Muhammad and Sheikh Ahmed. That's really interesting is that you can't really speak of them as like having sort of a cultish attitude that they disagree with one another, right? You know, that, I mean, I mean, because it seemed to me like Sheikh Abdullah was like the most prolific writer of all the three of them. And then you have the most harsh with Sheikh Ahmed is here because, you know, he, I think that he's the one that probably did the most to, um, somewhat, um, I guess you say, give off the impression to a lot of people that the Ghumadis were Shi'i, right? Because of of the statements he, about Muawiyah, the statements about, um, I mean, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and there were others, right? very harsh statements that he had about them. But it kind of goes back to when you look into some of the other statements about how his added, the sort of approach he took to Islam yeah, I think it is appropriate to refer to them as like reformers. And they seem like he sort of was like a reformer and that he, you know, they yeah, like follow the Didi, right? You know, whatever they consider to be evidence, they just went with that, you know, so they followed what they consider to be true, you know, even if it may be very offensive, you know. So so yeah, and then then Zamzami, I mean Muhammad Zamzami, it seems like, okay, well, with him. Uh, you know, he gets his reputation of being anti-Sufi. You know, it's like, okay, well, I thought they were, all the others were all Sufis, but it's like, okay, well, <laughs> so, but it's really, I, I just find it fascinating just to see 
members of the same family, and of course, members of the same same family, it's in some in some ways it's easy for us to differ, right? But at the same time, you would expect that people who grew up in the same house would at least have a similar sort of understanding of what is uh, an essential part of their identity. Which in this case, would be Islam, you know. But in this case, it doesn't really look that 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 was the situation. You know, uh, you know, that's just my interpretation of, of things. I don't know if you agree with that. You know, I just felt. <laughs> no, like, yeah. I mean, first, la madhabiyyat yeah. fil hadith. Yeah, yeah. In yeah. hadith sciences, there's no madhab. Right. We yeah. don't look at the madhab in hadith. I'm following. I'm trying to see the hadith, right. so that's why I don't see a differentiation in that between mm -hmm. someone who's madhab is Salafi versus Sufi and his orientation. Let's say mm -hmm. all that makes no difference. To be honest with you, at the end of the day, if the hadith is authentic to the mm -hmm. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that's all that matters. No. Um, as far as the uh, uh, the uh, the shiuch, I, mean, I, I definitely took from uh, Salafi shiuch, and some of them uh, uh, were very very Salafi, mm -hmm. and uh, and I took also from traditional al Sunnah and meaning in the sense of madhabi and ashari maturidi shiuch. Obviously, that was the majority of my shiuch. I did not really learn from any Shia shiuch per se. Uh, uh, riwaya I took only from Sayyid Muhammad Muhammad al Mansur, mm -hmm. Naib al Mufti in Yemen, who's a Zaidi uh, mm -hmm. in Riwaya. Um, as far as the Umaris, you're right, but even the, yani every single one is a school on their own simply because of the, the Dalil. Yes. So if the Dalil is authentic to him, then he stands with the Dalil wherever the Dalil puts him. Right, right. So his loyalty is really to the Prophet mm -hmm. and to the Dalil. Without stripping the dalil from fitthood dalil or fitthud nas, mm -hmm. and right. since uh, understandings vary, mm -hmm. you know, therefore positions vary as well. Right. As far as Sayyid Ahmad yani, and his accusation of the shayu, mm -hmm. and remember again, Sayyid Ahmad, mm -hmm. his his position from Muawiyah is based based on a hadith he found fil mm -hmm. and he yeah. said the rijal is rijal Muslim. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I weaken that hadith, yeah. not yeah. because rijal Muslim are weak. But right. because in my view, a hadith that is in the books of Gharaib, or Adab, or mm -hmm. Mafarid, mm -hmm. uh, etc., is, is a hadith that doesn't merit authenticity mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But uh, Sayyid Ahmad did not take his positions because he woke up one day and he said, you know what, I yeah. don't feel that way, I feel the other way. Right, but I'm right. trying to say, no matter what, what, what he did, yani in general, he mm -hmm. took it based on a narration. Yes, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, no. It makes total sense. Right. And, um, yeah, agree yeah. and disagree with the dalil. That, that's your problem. No problem. Mm -hmm. But it's unfair to say that yani, he had that that position because of just a, a hawa or a liking right. or right. an inclination. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I had a, a recent conversation with Dr. Khalid Bankership and we were talking about the, the problem of Islamic history. Uh, or the problem of Islamic histories, right? In other words, that um, when it comes, especially to the more controversial uh, matters of Islamic political history, that you'll find, you know, different uh, versions of 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 the lives of different people, right? Like, for instance, if you take someone like Yazid ibn Muawiyah, um, and so many, you know, some writers are speaking very negatively of him and speaking about like a, a lot of very, very atrocious things accused of, he's accused of. Other writers are like speaking of him as very positively, right? You know, I'm talking about ancient, like, you know, historic Muslim historians. And and so it becomes a bit of a challenge that way because then what happens is that the mainstream perspective is embraced and that becomes promoted and then Muslims forget, okay, well, there actually are other things to consider, you know, so, so I'm just I'm relating that, mention that to kind of related to this particular issue of, you know, so I can just, I disagree with the Sheikh on this point, you know, but the Sheikh wasn't just simply um, judging, uh, making this judgment based on, 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 on Hoa or Tashahi, right. As, as you, as you highlight, you know, there, okay. He finds a narration, he finds it to be, he considers it to be sound, you know, feels that, okay, this is um, good enough to make this come to the conclusion. I mean, this is similar to what you can find with hadith, which about like, uh, you know, like for instance, uh, <coughs> excuse me, right? So, so Ibn Adi, for instance, was of the, the view that that hadith is Hassan, right? Yeah. So I'm just like, okay, well, yeah, I, I, I think he's wrong, you know, but, but I don't think that anyone well, the hadith is like, life anyway. So, yeah, I mean. right, right. Yeah, so it's like okay, uh, yeah, it's da'if, it, it, but but I don't, I wouldn't say that his motivation for embracing a viewpoint 
about blacks or Ethiopians in this situation wasn't because of just some internal bias, right? It's hard to say that, you know, or rather, even if it was, you know, because of internal bias, we can't really know for certain because there's also the possibility that it was because he believes, genuinely believed that the Prophet said this, right? And so he was like, okay, I'm actually, uh, this is my view that I, I take the view because I believe this is what the Prophet expects from me, expect for me to believe, right? You know, so that's a different, and that's kind of hard for people today, you know, to sort of even, you know, things about women and all these things, you know, so, so often with people, all these, these Muslim men, most male scholars just came up with this, these hadith so they can control women. I said, well, uh, maybe not. Maybe they actually believe that the messenger actually said these things. And, and that in itself becomes that the motivation becomes faith rather than, uh, you know, malevolence or malice towards women, right? You know, so so it's really a, a challenge for many people today to try to uh, to to embrace the the nuance that is required, you know, for us to sort of humanize people. But yeah, I mean, you know, that's not an esma. I mean, esma is for the messenger Ali Salam, Salam, right? So yeah, but I'm sorry to continue, Shaker. <laughs> sorry, no, 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 no. You're right. I mean, the point, the, the position of Ahlul Hadith in general, if the Hadith is authentic to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa wasallam, it becomes Deen. Mm -hmm. So now, nothing else matters. Right. I I believe in it and I practice it. Mm -hmm. End the story. Irrespective of who's pleased and who's displeased. Mm -hmm. Right, and that right. was the position of those scholars. And right. like you said, so if they're wrong in the hadith, if the hadith is weak to you or so, then you should not blame their position as much. Right. You should find an excuse for their position. Right. Exactly. Allahu alam. Well, um, do you? Of course. I mean, you had some some writings. Can you speak a little bit about like the your publications and uh, and similar writings? Just. I for Allah. I think I'm very. I'm. <laughs> I'm not that of a, uh, I haven't reached that level anyway, but anyway, uh, writing is are really modest, I would say. Uh, I did tahqiq on the Shama'il Muhammadiyya, or Shama'il Nabi is actually the real name, Lit-Tirmidhi uh, Rahimahullah, Yani Hadithi Tahqiq. I think maybe the more genuine work, meaning, uh, that I uh, did was the concept, the book on the concept of bid'ah and its application, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also uh, the uh, commentary on the hadith of the seventy-three sects, mm -hmm. okay. uh, which is about a couple of hundred pages. Mm -hmm. A commentary on the hadith, uh, uh, can a critical commentary, naqd hadithi, mm -hmm. uh, to the hadith uh, uh, of al-Irbad. Uh, I'm leaving you. Uh, 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 the um, uh, oh, hold, um, no, hold now, Stafra, hold on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. right? On that one as well. I have recently, actually, I think you mean the one matter of Taktafik of Shayani lent the law into my set. No, 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 no. I like Hadith Erbad. I like I have a booklet on this Hadith that's also uh, out in the Arabic language. Uh, also, uh, a work that's out that just finished actually in the English translation. Now we're preparing to publish it. Is uh, and that is discussing mm -hmm. the uh, issue of inheritance mm -hmm. that uh, uh, from the Prophet that the Sahaba disagreed upon, mm -hmm. and uh, the issue of the hadith of Fatima Bad'atun Minni, mm -hmm. which I don't view to be authentic, okay. um, mm -hmm. though it's in the Sahih. Uh, I have another book mm -hmm. also uh, uh, that's genuine meaning i you know so i collected it first was the uh, 40 hadith on fada'il al-madina was ziyara mm -hmm. 40 authentic hadith uh, then i also did a commentary on the 40 hadith of mercy and those who show mercy by uh, ibn tolon al-hanafi rahimahullah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, i have some other hadithi works basically there it's just they're just ajza hadithiya Mm -hmm. on specific hadith and my naqd of them or a critical look at the hadith and its interpretation. Inshallah. So I know you do a lot of writing in Arabic, you know, so um, for those writings, 
are they mainly the ones that have been published? Are they been published in English or have they been published in Arabic or in both both languages? So I am publishing them in both. Now we're moving to publishing in both. So far, we haven't published much in English except the Bid'a okay. book, uh, the Book of Love, yeah. which is a book of aphorisms, uh, the book of the 40 Hadith on Mercy. Mm -hmm. I feel that the specific uh, works, Hadith works, with all the respect, mm -hmm. do not benefit much the English speaking in general because uh, with all the respect, the English speaking uh, is still... Um, in the subspecialty fields is not there yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so there's, you know, there's basic ulum ala missing to get to ulum al-hadith yeah. or ulum al-usul. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, in the West, in the English speaking world, it's generally a preaching world yes. rather than <laughs> rather than a traditional academic world anyway. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Very good point. Yeah, that, that's a good way to put it, right? It's a, it's a preaching world, you know. It, yeah, it's wild. Not ilm. Yes. I mean, we don't have. I'm not a alim. I'm mm -hmm. a student of knowledge. I don't think any. Yani, with all the respect to people, I don't think there's ulama. Mm -hmm. There are students of knowledge and preachers. Right, right. No, right. alim is a specialist in a field, and mm -hmm. okay, I put 35, 30 years in, mm -hmm. and maybe part, twenty of them at least in hadith studies. I don't think I, in all honesty, not in modesty, mm -hmm. in absolute all honesty and fairness, mm -hmm. I, I'm not a alim in hadith. Mm -hmm. I'm a student of knowledge. Yeah. 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 Maybe even that is tazkiyah of the nafs, yeah. but at least all right there. Mm -hmm. But alim yani means a, a, a master in something in, in a yeah. field in a specific field, whether mm -hmm. alim fil usul or alim fil lugha or yeah. alim fil tafsir or alim fil fiqh or alim fil hadith. Mm -hmm. We don't have that in the West in general. We may have borderline or good students of knowledge in fiqh, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Right? But madhabi fiqh as well. Yeah. Right. Right. The rest is a preaching world. I mean. That's what it is. I agree, sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, like, so where can people uh, access your the books uh, that you have? It's through the Medina Institute website, or is this uh, just Amazon? Yeah. I, I'm just putting. We're start. I just. I'm just in the phase now. I mean, I'm old now for that, but I'm just in the phase of establishing a website for myself, okay. and at the Medi and also a, a site at Medina itself, yeah, meaning off of Medina website. Mm -hmm. where we're going to put some of those books for sure. Right. Uh, the Book of Love and the Book of 40 Hadith on Mercy is already out. In the next maybe month or two, there'll be the book about the Sayyidah Fatima's hadith, uh, hadith and the discussion on the inheritance. Mm -hmm. uh, the 73 uh, sects book is uh, needs editing only because the translation was uh, had lots of, uh, missed lots of concepts there. So mm -hmm. um, we're redoing that. Mm -hmm. And I also have the bridge series, the bridge to Ulum al-Hadith and Ulum al-Quran is coming out. So we're going to put them all on the website, inshallah. Inshallah. So, I mean, why, why don't you speak a, a little bit about Medina Institute and the other projects that you have in, I know, South Africa and the other, you know, Norway, there's some sort of branches to, um, I think that's uh, important for the for the audience to know as well. So Medina Institute, like I said, after 9-11, mm -hmm. I thought mm -hmm. we need to do something. So let's, mm -hmm. let's, make let's found something so i i figured medina well, let's find let's find medina institute we did that here in atlanta mm -hmm. and uh, the idea was the idea was there before we i started that out when i was in california when i first came to the us uh, uh but in georgia it took sort of shape mm -hmm. uh we i taught at el medina institute and masjid uh, in georgia Mm -hmm. in Atlanta, Georgia, in Norcross, in Atlanta, Georgia, for about uh, 10 years. And uh, then I moved from Al Medina Institute and Masjid in Norcross, Atlanta, Georgia, which is a local masjid, mostly our uh, Indian Pakistanis in, in, in charge of the place. And we used to teach there, just like I teach now at the Medina. And then we eventually went to have our own premise, and we went from Al Medina to Medina. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, but Al Medina Institute and Masjid in Norcross here, mm -hmm. where I taught for 11 years, is still available and it's welcoming, and Allah bless them. Mm -hmm. um, the idea was we need to have number one, we need to have people because after 9 11, remember people depicting Islam and they don't know anything about Islam, mm -hmm. so we figured we need to have homegrown American Muslims who know about their faith, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to connect them to the tradition mm -hmm. so they don't go into this 
takfiri wave that was very prominent back then. And mm -hmm. lately it has sort of rhetorically died, but mm -hmm. uh, that was really difficult and exclusive righteousness and, mm -hmm. and all that business that was going on, which I thought were antithetical to really the message of Islam to start with. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I thought there was a need. So we started in Georgia and mm -hmm. then from that, uh, Medina also spread to the UK uh, and then we established it in South Africa and we became a fully accredited university mm -hmm. uh, in South Africa, uh, offering a fully accredited bachelor's, honors and master's degree. And we're pending for PhD. Okay. And the reason, obviously, the community in, 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 in South Africa was very supportive mm -hmm. and uh, very good. Allah bless them. Uh, in the U.S., the community is, but it's much more expensive to take a venture like this mm -hmm. and to go through accreditation and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and we're in Norway, we're in Malaysia as well, and other places. Inshallah. So how, we, how many students would you say you have um, across the, the world? <laughs> I think we graduated thousands. I mean, whether from the part-time and the full-time. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we have excess of 100 in the bachelor's degree program in South Africa. And I think about maybe, uh, if I'm not wrong, about 20 in the master's degree program. Uh, as far as in the U.S., Canada, and uh, and something, uh, and uh, U.K. and Norway, we running part time programs. We're not running a full time program there. And basically, the the program is designed to teach the traditional sciences mm -hmm. uh, from an empowerment perspective rather than indoctrination perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are very traditional, so it's much more of a seminary approach mm -hmm. rather than a university approach. Right. Uh, the only yeah. the only exception in that is uh, South Africa, which the Department of Higher Education allowed us to uh, have a an a university frame, but teach the seminary texts right in their depth and breadth. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, mashallah. And I know that you have some activities from time to time in Malaysia as well, right? Yes, I'm I'm appointed as uh, uh, one of the nine, uh, the only non-Malaysian board members of the uh, uh, Islamic University there by the king uh, for the past five years, four years. And uh, uh, I serve there in multiple capacities, official and non, and non-official as well. MashaAllah. Sheikh, I really do appreciate it. Um, do you have any closing words that you have uh, for our audience? Astaghfirullah. I think that, uh, look, we we, uh, we live in a time where the prophetic message of love and nonviolence and compassion is mostly needed. Uh, I think we would betray our faith and fail the test of our time if we don't look through the mechanics of the faith to the objectives of the faith and to the whole message of the faith as a whole. I don't really care what your uh, uh, yeah, madhabi uh, uh, orientation is, where you stand on that spectrum. But if that belief in Islam is not making you a better human being, mm -hmm. you've got issues, then you've got problems. Mm -hmm. If that belonging to the faith is not making you more forgiving, not making you more compassionate, not making you more loving, not making you more uh, uh, wanting to cooperate, not making you identify with the suffering of fellow creatures. Uh, I think there's a problem in, in, in that faith then in that, that you're claiming to understand or problem in your understanding of the faith. Uh, I, I hope and I think that we can eventually all agree. I dream, uh, let me use uh, Martin Luther's, I have a dream. <laughs> and, uh, and I have a dream that we, uh, intra-Islamically, obviously, that we agree on the Quran mm -hmm. and the uncontested, authentic, prophetic sunnah. I'm using uncontested. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to leave the contested as a separate bin for right now, irrespective mm -hmm. of what I, how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. But I think we can unite if we have a will to unite under the Quran and the uncontestedly authentic prophetic sunnah. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's enough for us there. And obviously, minding, minding, maratibul uh, adilla naqliya, minding that that's which definitive in attestation, definitive in indication comes first. Mm -hmm. uh, that's which is definitive in attestation, speculative in indication comes second. Minding the awlawiyat, the, the priority from a 
مراتب الادله اي ثينك وي كان دو ذات اف ذير از ا ويل there is no and that's righteousness in my view religiously speaking righteousness does not belong to me or to you or anybody else exclusively or to a group versus another exclusively mm-hmm. but i think we can unite on that and as a basis and then allow the different ijtihad different views of the speculative texts that are authentic to come to play so long they're founded on agreed upon scholastic academic methodology i think that's where we can get away from the cultish attitudes that you know implicitly we're the most righteous everybody else is wrong mm-hmm. and uh, if you don't follow us you're going to bid'ah and possibly shirk i think that's one solution to bring people around the quran and the sunnah now inter, inter- faith or you know intrahuman let's say yeah. i like i said i think we have a message as, as muslims to carry the prophetic message and the prophetic message the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came in a time that was rife with with evil rife with oppression rife with tyranny and violence slavery uh, 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 taking people's rights uh, mm-hmm. uh, stripping them from their from their humanity dehumanizing them in many ways women uh, the weak among society etc right everything al mawuda to suilat allah says mm-hmm. you know burying their own children because they they feel them it's a it's a liability mm-hmm. the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam emerged as the light of hope mm-hmm. in times that were very 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 difficult and and tyrannical and oppressive mm-hmm. and almost hopeless times and allah calls it calls his message message wama arsalnaka his mission wama arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin we send you ya rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a mercy to to the universe to all the creation mm-hmm. and i think we need to step up to that yes <laughs> and 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 we need to get out of our bickering i don't mind i actually i wish for clash of minds I want to cultivate the clash of minds mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but not the clash of hearts. The yes. clash of minds yields the best amongst us. Mm-hmm. When we look at the book and the authentic prophetic sunnah it's not contested as the foundation, but the clash of hearts is no good. So <clears throat> for humanity humanity today is deprived of lots of love, mm-hmm. of lots of compassion. You see what's happening, the social religious currents that are being composed that are mutually exclusive. Yes. Uh, basically the religious views that i call also things tasqih al aql yani the intelligentsia tasqih mm-hmm. means making something superficial yeah. I, instead of widening the intelligentsia of people mm-hmm. and 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 actually allowing it to grow mm-hmm. uh, we're trying to suppress it reduce it and dwarf it and and make it much very superficial mm-hmm. uh, this is where islam come and gives us hope no you know what you know let the mind grow and and let that intelligentsia grow and let us put these minds together let's clash those minds let's bring the best but let's love each other at the end of the day let's remember the prophetic message kullukum li adam wa adam min turab that al hakim authenticated rahimahullah all of you you know you may be from the different colors different ethnicities different cultures different uh, creeds but at the end of the day you are one people ya ayuhan nas mm-hmm. we are one human beings so i think we have a message and often times we want people to sympathize with us when it's our causes mm-hmm. and our pains yeah but the prophetic message was not that the mm-hmm. prophetic message was that and much more mm-hmm. we stood with the people who were oppressed irrespective of who they are yeah. we stood with those who were enslaved and kidnapped from their from mm-hmm. their tribes against their will right. uh, we stood with those who were sold against their will we stood with those who were who were treated unjustly we stood against the wars there is no option for war when peace is an option and yeah. uh, we stood with all these things also akhaka zaliman aw mazluma you have no you have an obligation to stand against oppression even if it's a muslim or your own blood brother irrespective of who the idea is not identity the idea is right versus wrong mm-hmm. and i think that gives us a, 
a, a, a moral obligation as Muslims <laughs> and as American Muslims to contribute to this good country where there's lots of good people, blacks and whites and everybody and Latinos and all that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I have to say also on this that uh, American Muslims stand tall today because of the African-American sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And it, it takes it takes people to stand and say truth with love, mm -hmm. with no hate, with mm -hmm. compassion and to engage everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think if we start Islam game, Allah Azza wa Jal gave us that freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. I know the Constitution gives us that, mm -hmm. but the First Amendment. But Allah says, "Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa qul al-haqq min Rabbikum, fa man shaa fa liyumin, wa man shaa fa liyakfur." Inna tanna liyadhalimin. Allah will judge people, but the, the Creator who created people mm -hmm. enabled them to disbelieve in Him. Mm -hmm. Yes. What What else do you want? So here I come as His creation. Mm -hmm. trying to channel his mercies onto the rest of his creation. I think we have an obligation to stand, uh, to, to start. If you can't say the truth, don't clap for the battle, mm -hmm. for right. evil. All right? sure. You can't say the truth, all right? Mm -hmm. Then at least don't clap for wrong. Right. Uh, I, I think we have an obligation to positively contribute to our communities, mm -hmm. the American Muslim community first and foremost, to ensure that uh, walls of hate are not uh, erected under the banner of love, mm -hmm. that walls of discrimination and prejudice and self-righteousness are not erected under the banner of, uh, you know, I my understanding is the only mutually exclusive righteous understanding. Right. Uh, we have an obligation to teach our community that the Quran and the uncontested authentic prophetic sunnah are the foundation of everything and the framework. Uh, upon which we all uh, uh, have to agree if we're Muslims. Uh, mm -hmm. To our fellow Americans who are not Muslims, we have an obligation to channel mercy, unconditional compassion, and uh, and contribute positively to for a better country for all. Yes. Uh, right. For humanity today, where people are deprived from love and individualism is becoming a religion and mm -hmm. sentiments are becoming religion yes. and abuse in every single name are, uh, become becomes a religion. Uh, it's, it's I think it's our our role to tell people, look, you have an all loving creator, an all merciful creator, an all forgiving creator. Uh, we have an obligation to make this world a better world. And we need to offer people love, even if they don't offer us, if, even if they offer us hate, yes. because hate towards hate only multiplies hate and we can't do that we need to be fundamentally nonviolent and i don't mean i don't mean that muslims are violent i believe that muslims are fundamentally nonviolent it's right. a mercy it's a nation of mercy anyway irrespective of the little oddity the oddities that happen here and there mm -hmm. but the reality is it's an ummah marhuma yes but we need to practice that and bring it out bring that mercy out into our communities and our countries and the world wherever we go we need to take an, a, a moral obligation leadership to, to 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 lead by example and not expect others to understand fully where we come from or our religion or our views and our philosophies mm -hmm. but to extend the hand of love and compassion and forgiveness to be honest with you uh, mm -hmm. to all. I think we have a big obligation to do. And I think American Muslims stand specifically in a unique position where they can tell the rest of Americans how Muslims, who Muslims are and what Muslims feel in the rest of the world because mm -hmm. the American Muslim community is probably the most educated and wealthiest Muslim community anywhere in the world. So mm -hmm. we can be that bridge. Inshallah. Barakallah fiqh ya shaykhna. Really do appreciate it. Um, thank you for your valuable time. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve you and grant you success in all that you do. And looking forward to the next uh, opportunity like this. Zakallah khair. Zakallah khair and kathiran shaykh. Shukran. Allah preserve you and bless you and your work and honored to be with you, Sidi. Amen. And assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hopefully you enjoyed that episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel here on YouTube and Spotify. Looking forward to seeing you in the next episode. God willing. Peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.